An Opening by Jeremy Thompson Jeremy Thompson's Shopping List Beer, IPAs, milk, water, paper towels, olive oil, candy, tortilla chips, tortillas, mozzarella, Mexican cheese, chili beans, ground beef, chicken, tomato sauce, chili seasoning, white onions, mole, bacon, eggs, apple cinnamon Cheerios, butter. Stumbling up the driveway, with every wobbling step a triumph for which he grinned in whiskey-snug dementia, Gilman just was a sight to behold. Eight days prior, he'd finally mustered up the courage to purchase his dream tattoo. Ebon bat wings sprouting from his lower eyelids, their well-replicated bones and membranes stretching from his earlobes to his chin. Knife slits made his spike-studded leather vest seem to breathe. So powerfully had the knight's music moved him, he torn clumps of hair from his scalp. A broken nose dribbled blood twixt his lips, which he sometimes spat to the ground, sometimes swallowed. Blood of another type coated his boots, shed by a parking lot scumfuck who'd never emerge from his coma. The bastard shouldn't have said what he said. The night sky was striated, exhibiting unearthly hues of yellow, green, and indigo. The fuck? Gilman wondered, realizing that those striations emanated from the condemned building that his girlfriend and he currently squatted in, a duplex's charcoaled corpse, with holes in the roof for starlight to slip through. Dismissing the sight as an acid flashback, Gilman wondered, Is Becky still up? I've got a cock for that angel. A tongue for her? Half erect, he stumbled through the door of the fire-gutted residence. The shadows were heavy, swallowing the meager illumination spilled by the stubs of black candles, drowning within their own wax. Bex, I've got something to give ya, he hollered. Come and get it. Receiving no reply, he added, Wake up, darling, I'm horny. Spilling from a crevice, a closet's remains, a figure fell to the floor and crawled into the candlelight. Greasy black hair overhung her back, which was to Gilman. A seeping wound blemished her goth attire. Bex, is that you? What's wrong, baby? Her throat hitched, unraveling a strangled sob. Say something. You're not on the nod again, are you? Shared needles were the emblems defining their courtship, but that was years ago. High school idiocy. Too many mutual friends had descended into grave soil. Jackalish. Time had expanded the void at the heart of things. Hey, what's that smell? Did you shit yourself? Is someone barbecuing garbage? What the fuck? Beneath a dress of black lace, flesh hills formed and collapsed. Afraid to step any nearer, Gilman murmured, I can't see your face. Reluctantly taking those steps, he breached the island of candlelight to gently grasp Becky's shoulder. Though she was the only person he'd ever loved, his every instinct demanded that he flee immediately. One perfect memory, them cuddled together in inebriated ecstasy amidst a sea of concert goers, as a pallid faced rock and roll frontman chucked raw steaks to frothing fans, darkly intoning, returned to him, then shattered. Please, Becky, look at me. Startled by a sudden silence, it took Gilman a moment to recognize it as human speech, a hellish parody of his beloved's voice. <laughs> They came down through the ceiling. Each had dozens of eyes. Becky hissed, wheezed. The goddamn light! She then shrieked. Gilly, is that you? I must have been blinded. As his post-fight adrenaline abated and numbness supplanted each and every one of his accumulated aches, Gilman groped for phraseology to set the world right. What happened? He eventually asked, meeker than seemed possible. You're not making any sense to me, baby. Don't touch her, a voice in his head demanded, a stern tone he'd never heard before. Defying it, Gilman crouched next to his girlfriend. Thrusting his fingers through sweat-slimy locks, he grasped her jaw. It feels... skeely. 
he thought, turning her countenance toward him. What's that word horror flicks use? Fucking squamous. Shrieking, Gilman abruptly leapt backward, thinking, that can't be real. Not that. That. Whatever it was. He stared at his feet to avoid confirmation, reminded of salting snails as a child to observe their slow bubbling implosions. This is just a nightmare, goddammit. I passed out somewhere, at some point. It's my imagination, nothing more. Too many Cronenberg and Carpenter movies as a kid. Gilman. You're not Becky. You could have stopped them, Gilman. You're lying, he whispered. Creatures I've never seen before, Gilman. No one here to protect me. Becky. Raising his eyes. Defeated, he felt his every spectral ancestor turn away in disgust. All your dreams are pathetic, declared his dying ego. On her hands and knees, Becky faced him, her neck bent unnaturally, her lips and nostrils now absent. Below two tear-streaming eyes, her mouth had enlarged to account for most of her face, wide enough to swallow bowling balls. That separating tunnel wailed Gilman's name. Wake up! He cried, punching himself in the temple to dissolve a non-existent nightmare. Wake up, you dumb bastard! Gilman, stop that. I... I don't wanna... He countered, self-inflicting a blow that blurred his vision. In a brief, gorgeous haze, Becky seemed herself. The same as always. But when clarity returned... So did her blasphemous maw. The sight of it was so disturbing that, had Gilman been gripping a firearm, he'd have squeezed its trigger until Becky's entire visage was obliterated. As his girlfriend unsteadily stood up, keeping her warped face upraised, a realization struck Gilman. The tunnel was widening. Into that ebon void, Becky's eyes disappeared. As the tunnel traveled down her neck and torso, the black dress she'd been wearing fell to tatters, while Becky's proportions swelled ovaloid. Soon, all that remained of her was a flesh-and-bone tunnel mouth, featureless, save for random hair clumps. The passage's depth seemed illimitable, its destination point galaxies distant. Impossibly respiring, it wafted out decay stenches. Gilman. His name arrived hideous, devoid of humanity, like an a cappella record with its RPM sped up. Echoed as a prolonged moan, it went, Gilman. Suddenly, an arrival, a head the size of a school bus emerging from the passage. Is that thing from hell or from Mars? Gilman wondered, even as terror-spurred regurgitation sent brown chunks down his leather. Fish-like flesh, separating wet, iridescent, covered the monster. Its strangely configured skull radiated gloom light through its face. Of its shoulder-length hair, a rapier-thin segment descended from a forehead full of thrumming antennae, past its chin, bisecting a pallid countenance wherein deep-set, burning eyes like hell cherries glared above an anemone fish's mouth. From that rubbery, toothless maw, a basso profundo sonance emerged. With impossible elasticity, what remained of Becky widened enough for the behemoth's shoulders to pass earthward. There were four of them in total, attached to a quartet of humanoid arms that encircled the monster. Two where arms usually dwell, plus another mid-chest and another mid-back, right above its quadrupled legs. Its muscles exceeded in girth those of the most roided-out bodybuilders. Dark hair enshrouded its torso. Awkwardly, the creature crouched, having emerged entirely, the vaulted ceiling not being tall enough for it to stand upright. Retreating from the new arrival, Gilman froze in his tracks when the thing pointed at Becky and roared throatily. Seconds later, its sibling emerged from that same flesh-and-bone passage, followed by another, and another. 
The condemned residents being too meager to contain them, the four giants smashed through its plaster and steel to greet the night. Wolf-like they howled under a gibbous moon that now shone cherry red. After sparing one last glance for his desecrated soulmate, knowing that all the promises they had made to each other had been rendered irrelevant, Gilman followed Becky's unnatural spawn into the eerily striated nightscape. Already the four monsters were bludgeoning menfolk to death and abducting women for sexual congress. Crumpled corpses bestrew crimsoning lawns, bodiless heads perched atop hedges. Taller than buildings, Becky's children howled a chorus that connected with Gilman on a level most primal. He found himself grinning dangerously, darkly amused. Remembering the parking lot scumfuck from earlier, and the way that his skull met the blacktop was such a satisfying crack, he smiled even wider. Mid-street, a broken man crawled, blood masking his features. Please call the police, he mewled, mush-faced. When Gilman began to howl, approaching the crawler, that pulped facial mass shaped itself quizzical. Oh, what are you- wait! were the man's final words as Gilman lifted his boot. From both ends of the street, shrieking sirens proclaimed fresh arrivals. Squad cars, ambulances, and fire engines offering hollow reassurances. Gunshots sounded, as did cries of terror once it became apparent that Becky's howling progeny were immune to the slugs. Buried in residential wreckage, half-dead families wailed, agonized. The unholy quartet departed the neighborhood, howling for societal annihilation, each with a woman slung over their shoulder. Soon they'll be parents too, Gilman surmised. Down came his boot, satisfyingly.